All right. So this is the after, well, it's the after volume Hi. discussion. Hello, Yash. Uh, we're starting recording. So we're going to be talking today about what everyone thought of volume eight. And it was a gigantic volume, as everyone knows. So this won't be too in depth about you know individual chapters or individual characters or anything like that it's more of a broad strokes perspective on everyone's thoughts and feelings about the volume overall and maybe their favorite arcs their favorite storylines or their least favorite uh you know moments they really liked you know that kind of thing so to start us out we're going to go uh, over this question that I posted in audio chat recorded, and it is, how did you feel the volume overall went? What aspects did you really enjoy, and which did you feel like needed improvement? So I'll start us off. Uh, if anyone wants to talk, just ping me, but or just type what you want said in audio chat recorded. But first, I'll go over what I, uh, how I felt about it, and. I, I really did enjoy the volume a lot. It was very, very different from any other volume we've had beforehand because it was a very plot focused volume and there was definite uh there's numerous different plots all over the place that we saw moving forward at record speed compared to how we've um seen them in the past. And I, I think that was something that really helped move along the story and it really helped uh, give other characters moments to shine. And so that that is definitely one aspect I really enjoyed. And um, in addition to that, uh, other aspects I enjoyed is just getting to see all the characters. You know, uh, in previous volumes, we've, you know, kind of, sh we've kind of expanded the cast a lot but we've also focused more on certain areas over others. But in this volume, we had a very eclectic mix of characters that we focused on, and we got to see almost all of them. You know, there were some, such as Lakin and Rakir, that we didn't see much of, but we got most of the characters and a lot of plot lines involved with them. One thing I do think could have been improved was just overall how long it was honestly it, if it could have been cut down in size it would have been better maybe possibly i i don't know how it could have been cut down but just cutting parts of it so it didn't go on so long is basically what i think could improve with it that's all my opinions so let's go to linu I again so uh for me this volume was the best volume so far. I absolutely loved most of it. Uh starting with plus I really liked and to which I enjoyed. I was for I was for starter Chandra and all the plots in it. Like uh we had horns who were sent there by that uh, greater teleport spell. And they were scattered all across to, all across it. Uh, we have seen many different characters, thanks to that, many different countries uh, in Chandral. Like we have seen that Golem Nation, we have seen Naravia Fallen, uh, we have seen Pomle, uh, our little necromancer Pisces and friends' adventures against slavers and slavery. Uh, Seria eating Kielats and stuff in those uh, pirates countries so uh chandra 100 percent loved it really great prod uh then we had i mean it was before in plot but uh i had on my, uh, another thing i loved really was attack on village of death because before that uh really all we knew about putrit one was that Pisces could probably rival him in level because he was close he, he was above level 30 because he could he could have a horde of undead or something how it was on Iviki. 
and what people laughed about. But now we saw proper, uh, properly how high level necromancer could be really, really OP. How uh, he could have revenants that were basically unbeatable. How he could have his minions that were like on a totally different level compared to what we saw from Ashkarash or current necromancers in story. Uh, then we have. Wistram on my little list. Uh, Wistram for uh, two things. First off, Teriach in Wistram. It was funny to see him uh, basically dwelling into that new Wistram, that new Wistram in Wanik world that lost most of its uh, mass, much of its power, and isn't isn't that strong anymore. And him fighting Cognita, doing all his adventures. And then we had second Wistram plot, which was like freeing uh, Archmage Ameris. Uh, with uh, best gear uh, Aseani, it was also 10 out of 10. One of the best plots, Emo. Uh, funny, but also kind of heartbreaking to see Trey uh, kind of betraying people and how it went for him. Uh, also, I loved uh, Deathless appearance in some chapters. We all knew for uh, one reason, yes, because I simp for Sylvania. Uh, I loved uh, Fellowship because it really reminded me of Lord of the Rings in some way. Uh, Grand Shadows El Davin, because he was kind of a new addition. Like, it was new Wistram. New Wistram, I mean, new Wistram in this world, uh, which came back to his uh, to its roots, where uh, Wistram was strong, where Wistram meant power, when uh, Wistram meant powerful magic. Uh, him, basically, going full on on Islet Damus being like, oh, you fools, now I'm going to smite you with the power of Archmages of old. You are going to burn if you are going to fight me and being basically total chat. So those were things I really loved about current volume. And I disliked Erin just because I disliked uh, dislike Erin. Uh, I disliked Ordegnol's plot because there was too many characters in them that I really couldn't get behind, and I didn't really like love them much. Uh, and I disliked Baleros because it was so hard for me to read it. Like Baleros plots were so boring to me that I was trying to read uh, last Baleros chapters like three or four times, but whenever I tried to, I got to like one third of that chapter, and I just couldn't get past it. Like, literally, I didn't do it till this day because it's just too boring for me. It doesn't even feel like wandering into me. And, like, I think it would be all. So, like, overall, Volume 8, loved. But some things were too boring for me. But apart from it, I love it. I know Lynette definitely has some opinions on thinking Belarus is, uh, Belarus is uh, boring. but. Let's just say, so what do you think could have been improved about those chapters? Like, if you had to say why it was boring, what would have made it better for you? Uh, for me, it was because, like, I can't, like, after all those volumes, uh, like, I read uh, uh, all the chapters of Baleros before, but I really can't get a grasp on who is, uh, who on Baleros. It's like I get behind characters. Who is that Gil, Gil Umina? Who is someone? Who is uh, someone other? Like it's too chaotic for me. I can't understand it properly, and because I can't understand it properly, and can I can't be get behind characters and their motivations, uh, how the plot is com going on, and how even Balero's structure looks like. Uh, it's, it's too messy for me. I can't really understand it. But maybe too many characters with too little screen time, so we can't really connect to them as much, is what you're trying to say? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Linu. Um, I definitely agree with a lot of your um, a lot of your great moments for the volume, but I, I, I love Aaron, so I can't say I agree with you there, and I really enjoyed Belarus because we got some Freyling lore that was awesome, so... Also, yes, I, I can't, I don't have any clue how to pronounce Belarus, so I just do it Belarus. I say uh, Belarus. Yeah. 
I, I have no idea how that's supposed to be pronounced, so I, I probably butcher it. Um, Idu, you wanted to speak. Yes. Um, overall, Volume 8 isn't one of my favorite volumes. Um, I Before I started uh, talking, I just had to check what even was in Volume 8, because uh, in my head, it's like everything now. It's, it was so huge. Um, what I liked, really, really liked, is even before Aaron died, that you saw a little bit more of um, her character progression of her having have, having and made uh, her name for herself how she is basically how, how the wandering in basically became a power like one of the great families in my head almost because um the last big thing erin did before she died was uh gathering a freaking army. I don't know who else could have done that. And uh, the whole thing with the players. And we saw... Yeah, we, we just saw a little bit of Aaron's uh, progression. Um, the main thing about Volume 8, Aaron's death and how to get her back and all that what's happened and spawned because of that. Um, in my opinion, it was a good idea because it's like um, having your cake and eating it at the same time. We got a glimpse of what we, we, we saw, how characters would react when Eren died. And um, with the full knowledge that Eren is obviously is coming back, I, I guess nobody believed for a second that Eren is going to die if Eren is going to die and not coming back. Um... That's why it's um, always a little bit... I, I, I personally don't like when stuff like this happens um, because it cheapens real character deaths, in my opinion. And, um, yeah, that's why, overall, um, I came to TWI because of the slice of life aspects and the characters that I like, and this volume was most likely plot. We got an answer to so many questions about White Knowles, about uh, the gods, about, I don't know, so many things. And um, it's obviously, it's important that we know about this all of this, but I personally wish that we are, can go back a little bit more to Erin just running her in and being her adorable self. Uh, and all, of, yeah, and, uh, all the other characters, I still love the horns, of course, what they have, what they have become, how they've grown. Um, there had to be a crisis so they could grow, of course. Um, but overall, this volume was, I don't want to say a little bit too serious, but yeah, it kind of was, and it was long, a bit too long because of that. All right, well, one second, I, uh, Alias, uh, you're talking in stream spoilers while you should be talking in audio chat or audio chat recorded for this since that's the oh, those thank, are the channels for this. yeah thank you I, di I didn't even realize that i must have muted that like months ago and forgot that it was that yeah was so there. I, di I didn't know what that room was for so i think i muted it and had it vanished sorry about that yeah you know no problem i just wanted to make sure you're actually part of this the discussion and i also posted the, the guidelines on how this all works if you want to read that real fast but going back to you, Edu, um, I, I definitely get where you're coming from with uh, the whole Aaron being dead, not dead is kind of cheapening in a way. But I feel like because it was made so clear that she wasn't really dead, right, like the very next chapter or even at the very end of that, 
uh, 7.61 or whatever it was, even at the end of that, it was pretty clear that she wasn't truly dead. And so it was made so very clear right then that I, I don't think it really cheapened it. It made it so that we knew that she wasn't really dead, but at the same time, she was close to dead and she was completely missing from all these people's lives. So we could get into uh, the emotional impact that uh, their, her absence has and her, uh, her possible death has on all these characters. That's that's what I meant with uh, eating a cake and having it, and still having it. Um, but because we already know that Aaron is gonna come back, it's a little bit to see all all the all the rage and all the emotions. I don't know if if I would say they are unnecessary. They they feel like uh, I don't know. Yeah, because because it's 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 a bit cheapened, I guess. You see more turning into a complete monster and not this gentle giant that we uh that we know. And uh, I don't know. It's it's it saddens me to see a character go down this path just just to come back because, yeah, surprise, Aaron is not really dead. Well, I don't know. We we haven't really seen if he will come back from this yet. So no, I think it's a, I think it's a no. bit early to say whether or not yeah, he's okay. going to fully come back. But I, I get what you're trying to say, though, that he has a way to be redeemed now without, you know, and all, serious all, all, And all of the deaths because of the Hectival War... I mean, so many people died probably because uh, Olesem f- through g- goes into a complete rampage and let's kill Activel and blah 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 and I I don't know. <sighs> I mean, first of all, Aaron is the last pe- person who would have wanted that. Oh, she and... definitely wouldn't have wanted that for sure. Huh? She definitely wouldn't have wanted that kind of yeah. thing to be done. And it's also one thing. I mean, I mean, it's gonna be a, a source of um, a great source if she finds out. I mean, she will find out how basically how many people died to either rescue or avenge her, because many people did die and so many shit happened because she died or apparently died. And I mean, yeah. I mean, the characters obviously didn't know that she would come back, but we did know. So everything I read is like, yeah, but she's gonna come back, you know. So why uh, the fuss that was made out of it is a bit cheapened, in my opinion, because of that. Sounds. I, I'm not good at explaining my feelings. Sorry. Oh, no, I, I understand. I, I I definitely get it. I just you know I I tend to disagree on how it makes me feel, and and you know that, yeah. that that's that's to be expected. We all read this story different ways, and we all True. react to it differently. All right, so let's move on to Yash. You wanted to speak. Hi. Hello. All right. So I felt like this. Um. So I feel like. The Wandering in, in general is like a multiple course meal. So volume one was probably the Amos Bush, and then we had the Archery. And right now, we're like in the thick of it. We're in the middle of the course. And it's ending, but you know, it's going to end with a bang just before the dessert is going to blow our minds. So I feel that was very representative. <laughs> a very long metaphor was what I felt about this chapter was what I felt about this volume in general. It was, it felt larger than life to me. And maybe it's me projecting what I read about online or what I see daily into my, uh, you know, mode of escapism. But I, I was able to relate a lot of themes of what's happening in the real world with what's happening in, uh, what's happening in the volume. And it felt almost cathartic to talk about 
the same things that we are going through, but in a very meta way, without really getting personal about it. And it, in you know, in Ryoka terms, it gave me a lot of perspective. Be it geopolitics, be it how people have dealt with the pandemic. We saw everything. We saw all of it play out in volume eight. Every every kind of back trip that the world went on these past two years, we saw it play out in one in this volume. And it gave us perspective. It gave us a chance to think about it without knowing it. And pirate sort of you know sneaked. She was very sneaky <laughs> in making her stance clear about something, their stance clear about something, or making us think about something that we otherwise would not have. And maybe I'm feeling that way. Maybe I'm not a few who's feeling that way, but maybe I'm not a few who's feeling that. Way. But the reason it did not feel like size of life, like Eddie mentioned, was because there was so much of the same shit that's happening to us. <laughs> In TWI as well, be it coincidental or not, and I very much enjoyed that. The plots, the twists, it was so fantastical and so magical, and you know, it was larger than life. I really enjoyed it, and yes, it was long, but very honestly, I'm such a greedy duck. I even if it was longer, I wouldn't have minded. <laughs> Whatever pirate gives me, I will consume. I have no issues, and um, in general, I was supremely satisfied with a lot of the answers that were given. The gnomes, oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm so happy we have clarity about the gnomes now, and just a lot of plots in general. I would have loved more clarity on the elves. Uh, probably we'll get into that in the coming volumes. And I did feel like the deadlines were a little rushed, but the writing. One thing I really want to talk about is how pirates' writing and the quality of the chapters has increased massively. So, uh, especially during the slavery chapters uh, from Pisces's version, I I thought I won't be able to read it. And very honestly, the first uh, when it came out, I couldn't. I asked. Somebody to give me spoilers. I asked somebody to, you know, give me the cliff notes of the chapter, and I began reading. Then the bad parts got over. But when it was over, and when I was able to revisit it, the editing, the quality, how themes have been handled, the maturity with which the themes have been handled, was really startling. And it was, I don't know, it makes me want to cry when I think about it. And is. I cannot believe the quality of writing that we're getting, and I I don't I don't think we deserve it very honestly, because I think I mentioned it in a podcast uh, in a recorded uh, thing before this as well. When you read about the dead lands, you feel uncomfortable. When you read about island names, you feel a certain way, and because the writing changes, her writing in island names changes, her writing in chapter art changes. When she's writing about the knolls, her method of description of things changes from a very to a very knollish perspective. And when she's writing about the inn, that's when we get to hear pirate through pirate, because that's when she gets back. And I feel like it was almost reflective of what pirate was going through, in that she wanted to expand. She felt like maybe she. I'm saying she, but I mean they. Please, like maybe they felt like they were being restricted by a character, and they needed to explore the world that they had created more without restricting themselves. And I'm so happy that they did. Yes, I knew. Uh, again, coming back to Eddie's point, we all knew that Eddie was going to come back, but that was never the point. The death was simply a way for us to expand on the world. To Finally, move away from. Even though we want to keep going back to something, it was like we were addicted. We were addicted to Erin, and we wanted her perspective more. We wanted the slice of life more. But the world is so rich. It's a. It would have been such a crime to be restricted to, to one point of view. 
and i'm very happy that we did and i'm very happy that we did in this chapter with so much quality and so much clarity of thought and overall i'm very satisfied volume 8 was probably one of my favorite ones so far yeah, you're absolutely right about the whole grander greater than life statement like and that's a that's a lot of what i really appreciate about fantasy is when it makes everything you know greater than what you kind of expect it to be you, you know it, it it makes it an epic basically i i really love epic fantasies and uh pirate abba does it very well mixes it in, in with just the whole slice of life uh type of deal as well and i think that kind of combination is something that is only rarely done but when it's done well it makes for amazing stories and I also definitely agree with you that we've seen constant improvement in how Pirate Abba writes and how they go about telling the story. You know, you can just go back and look at Volume 1 and Volume 2 and compare it to Volume 7 and Volume 8. The difference in writing and the difference in how they can connect emotions to characters and how they can, you know, even just describe scenery that's all been being improved upon over time and you know a lot of uh web serial authors you know you'll go and look at reviews for their work and it just says you know they get better over time they all get better over time and i think a lot of that is uh just the readers you know getting more involved in the story so they think the author gets better over time but in the wandering inn's case i really do think that over time, Pirate Abba has gotten much, much better at just writing this story and writing in general. It, it, it's very, uh, it's very clear how much they've improved over time, and I think it definitely shows in the conclusions to a lot of these plots we've been seeing in this volume. All right, let's move on to some of these comments. Uh, Ren says, I don't think what happened with Aaron or her revival cheapens things at all. And yeah, that, uh, it's just kind of like an opinion thing that I think Ed Edu had that, you know, we're not all going to be on the same page with it simply because of how we're reading it and how we're reacting to the emotional changes that we see in the characters. Uh, Demi replies the Ren by saying, I'm of the same opinion because we kind of know that that method of revival won't work anymore since the afterlife has now changed. Happy Panda says, it went the way it needed to go for the end to finally start wandering. And maybe we won't actually see a wandering in, but the story itself was able to wander around for 2.5 million words or whatever it was for a long time and so we got a lot of different perspectives that yes we wouldn't have been able to see too much of with aaron dominating the story um ren says not only that but the character's feelings were very much real and justified yeah i definitely agree with that um demi says i just hoped we would have had a bit of interaction between aaron and the chandra characters floss fedahep and gazi and between aaron and nears uh yeah, I definitely I definitely feel the uh the flaw, uh, the Chandra characters going away right away. And, like it, it hurts cuz I you're absolutely right. It would have been great to see Aaron re, um Aaron interacting with Gazi and Floss and Fedohep. Although Fedohep obviously s still can interact with her because he's going to you know, he's going to send her a message spell or whatever. He's going to send her a speaking stone that she can use whenever she wants to talk to him. So we'll definitely get Fettelhep interactions. I just don't know if we'll get uh, Floss and Gazzy reactions or, or interactions, I should say, by um, any time soon. But still, I I still think it was a great ending. Um Yash says, I think it was by design. Yeah, it certainly was by design. Like, they don't want those interactions to be right now. And so they're not going to be right now. That's just how it is. But we can always hope 
Happy Panda says Aaron will interact with them once she starts her second in there. Hopefully, we've uh, we've theorized a lot about franchising the inn. I don't know if it'll happen, but I kind of hope it does at one point. All right, let's move on to our second question of the day. I'm going to post it in chat real fast. So the question is, oh, let me just read out the last reaction first. Demi says, also, I miss the emotional impact from the horns. And yeah, we'll, I, I think we'll get into the horns more once in, we're into volume nine, for sure. We'll get to see quite a bit more of them. But, oh, the horn call. Oh, hmm. Emotional impact from the horn call? Hmm. I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but if you would like to explain, I'll read out this question and then I'll come back to that once you're done typing. But um, so the question is, what is the one line, good or bad, that stands out in your mind from this volume? So I have two lines that I've picked for myself that have stood out in my mind. One is actually from the epilogue and it's from Zainer, the go the the last gnome i i don't know how to say his name i'm going to say Zainer, but his the line that the joke is this the gods did defeat the dead they ate every last ghost two gods fell and two more were carried away all by ghosts a single innkeeper escaped the gods and the fairy king drew his odd designs across fate itself then then Cassigna said, we will surely win this time. And, you know, that just like perfect, uh, that just perfect, perfectly encapsulates the God's whole um, hubris, uh, hubris and their, you know, kind of idiocy. It just, they keep thinking, oh, this time everything's going to go right for us. This time we're going to be good. This time we're going to win. Even though, Time after time, they're losing and they're losing and they're losing, but they just can't change how they are. And it's really, obviously, it's something that it's something that I just read, you know, pretty soon. Uh, it's something that I read not too long ago, so it sticks out in my mind more. But um, it still is a very powerful line, I feel, because it really just explains the issues the gods have. Uh, the second line was an interlude. Pisces, where he summons the um, he summons the skeleton lord, and he says, "The living do such cruel things. You are so much simpler. You are made of things that called themselves men, but I ask you to be more than they were. To give, not take alone. Will you betray my hopes too? Can I make nothing beautiful, nothing that lasts? Will you help me?" I think that was just an absolutely perfect line to. Uh, to use there because Pisces really, really went through so much that chapter and he just struggled so much with what was happening to him, what other people were done to him. And it shows that he's actually growing and wanting to change what he, who he is basically. And I think it really is powerful because he wants to help people rather than how he was beforehand, you know, where he kind of pushed people away at the very beginning of the story. And now he's someone who wants to help everyone. And I just really like that line. All right, Linu, you wanted to speak. Yes, I wanted to speak. I also have two lines. Uh... First one is from chapter 882, part one. It's from where uh, Sp uh, Sprigena went into Cowin's Ka heart. And for me, it was basically a line that made me literally cry in real life because I have always thought that gods couldn't be just bad or were always bad. And when I read that line, it like struck me like a literally emotion emotional lightning it went like this then she left like she was younger running across the ground in a better time when mortals and gods touch hands without fear 
when they spoke and for all they worried and quared, she believed in them. Uh, it was so powerful line to me that there was a time where uh, gods and mortals lived uh, together and you know, mortals and mortals because you know elves are immortals. Uh, but still, for me, it was like a very, very powerful moment, even though I don't think for many other people would be as well. And uh, second, second line was from 832. It, of course, had to be line of one of the deathless. Uh, in this time, it wasn't uh, Sylvania. It was uh, Chatwa when they were hovering over uh, Lalai Sanction. If I remember correctly the name of the city, you know, the capital of Rochal, uh, both Sylvania and Chatwa. And Chatwa basically said, I am the death of chains. Look up, you craven holders, holders of chains. Look up, my kin. I will never die. So long as I live, let all those who hold chains tremble. One day we will cast this place into the sea. We have returned. Cover and fear our return. Believe the lies of the Blighted Kingdom if you wish. We did not cast that spell that tore the world apart. We never desired this war. Only freedom. And for me, it was so power powerful de uh, declaration in that very moment. That it, uh, again, hit like a brick into the head. With a really strong line, somewha something I will, I think, forever remember. Because she was giving hope to all those people uh, that were in uh, this uh, wretched capital, which is place where uh, you see that beautiful city outside, world, but all those horrors in old people, uh, those old people that are kept in cages, that are kept as uh, slaves. And they too, basically, were they, uh, were hovering over that, uh, that place, and screaming words of hope to them. For me, it's something astonishing that even in place where you shouldn't have any hope, there was someone to give them, right? That would be it for me. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And a lot of these emotional impact lines are just great overall and how they kind of make you feel that these characters just like, want to help others and they want to save everyone that they care about and it's they really hit home in a lot of ways um let me just go through demi's thought on the horn call real fast and then we'll get to you mr europe uh demi says i mean horn call it was just glossed over a bit you had various characters saying oh i hear horn and then immediately immediately moving on as if nothing happened and um my response to that would just be i think it was just because there was so much happening that we couldn't go into too much depth on that in particular but i understand where you're coming from definitely but mr europe what is your one line good or bad well the uh i added this question and my uh, my main two lines have already been taken uh that the uh first the gnome joke and then pirate mentioning in chat the and then she woke up uh for the for the ending but my the reason why i added good or bad is because i have one line that i can't get out of my head and it's uh hey you you're finally awake uh you were trying to cross the border right walked into that ambush same as us <laughs> which is a uh very uh, yeah, it's the Skyrim meme. Yeah, the, that Skyrim meme was, it was kind of like a fever dream, basically. It was like, it it just kept going on, too. It was one big joke, and it was very funny, but at the same time, it was like, is this actually happening? Is this meme really being canonized into TWI? It was very funny, but I, I understand that it, those other two lines were great too. Um, let's go on to Thetacron who says, oh, he, uh, Thetacron was responding to the horn call thing saying, Ryoka is Rochal. She didn't hear the horn call. Don't know what you mean by that exactly. Thetacron. Uh, I don't did. 
we hear about if she heard the horn? I don't know. Anyways, 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 anyways. Uh, Pirate Avis says their favorite line was, and then she woke up. I was very worried and curious to see how people would react when I wrote the first Aaron chapter, but I knew it had to happen. Even Dead in Volume was far too long, although I know it lasted, lasted a while without Ryoka. Just dropping by to derail the chat, I'll, re I'll listen to the recording when it comes out. And yeah, the, <laughs> I, I'm sure it was a big relief to finally get Aaron to wake up. You know, it, it's been 2.5 million words. It's been a long time, a year and a half. It, it was a lot to go through while uh, having one of the main characters basically gone. And so it, it definitely, I'm sure it feels great to have that over with. Uh, yeah, she wanted to speak. Yeah, oh my god, I don't know how to like talk five now. Mm. <laughs> okay, but uh, one of my favorite chapters was when Magnolia uh, and Lynette are having a discussion about Magnolia's plans to unite the north of the south. And she says, you know, she says a very sappy line at the end of it. When you want something done, Miss Marquis, you should likely know which strings to pull or bridges to burn. And I feel like this is a very, <laughs> this is a very practical life and a very, it spoke to me, it, especially in the line of work that I'm in, the line of um, just where the world is right now. I feel like we could have used somebody like Magnolia, somebody who thought this way, who thinks this way. And I, it just showed me how bad ass Magnolia is. Like, I love her. And she's just so, she knows what wishes to work. She knows, you know, how to key in people. She knows how to get things done. Even if she has to sacrifice herself, her Whatever she has to, she'll do whatever she has to. But if something has to get done, she will get it done. There's no two ways about it. And I really respect her. And this was one of my favorite lines. In fact, almost everything Magnolia says is so iconic. You could just quote everything that Magnolia has ever said. And I would say that's my favorite. Yeah, Mag feels like someone who everyone else. And it kind of, they quoted this line from, I'm not sure what chapter it is, but I'll just read it out. It great line. These lines again. It's just you, like that is an amazing line too. I, I love it so much. Her an anti appraisal was in volume seven, so it doesn't really count. But thank you. It has a sign out front. If you choose to read it, which not many do, it says, "Should you venture inside, you might meet an innkeeper. If you do, not always dangerous or exciting. Often, but not always." But you will be safe, safe for a given value as fine. Uh, so Setokron says, the Ryoka comment was just a joke since I can't think we actually see her hearing the horn. Uh, I have a lot of favorite lines, so I can't really pick one. Off the top of my head, I did like this, though. Hello, little nemesis of mine. Would you kindly die for me? I had hoped you already were rotting in the grave. Bella genuinely hates this seven-year-old kid. Stops time to tell her this. And yeah, Bella's, Bella Veer's, you know, absolute hatred of a child really shows how disconnected she is from everything. Like, it doesn't matter to her what you are, who you are, or where, or, or how old you are. It just, if you're in her way and you've, you know, if you've done her wrong, she's going to hate you no matter what. Linu gave me the chapter number. Demi says, not really a quote, but innkeepers? Question mark. Well, Quellot didn't have a problem with any specifically, but crossbows were exceptionally effective there too. Yeah, just the, and that's from 8.76. Um, the kind of dry humor we get with these kinds of lines always cracks me up too, because. It just kind of, you know, these meta comments always make me laugh. Yash says, there was a time when classes used to have commas. Another 
and that is like 8.7 or something 8.70 i should say um kit said oh they're they were telling me the quote from where they got that quote from which was 8.38h for their quote about uh Pisces, pisces home uh Linu says they forgot a quote. It's not emotional, so I didn't include it, but it was very funny to me. The quote is, Someone else was nearly assassinated by a Belorushian banana, the greatest threat to the mortal world, the magical nightmare only checked by the defenders of the world, one of hell's regions. But that's the magic. Finally got it down. <laughs> yeah, I... Man, this is great. I love all these quotes. Uh, Happy Panda says, in relation, in response to Demi's comment, that it's not true anymore for Aaron. There, and it's it's very good. Aaron has a crossbow immunity now. You can't kill her with crossbows anymore. Kylara says their quote is, "I'm not dead, only chilling. Don't die on me. I have to serve you pasta again." Eight point. And that's from 8.58 PFH. Demi says, I'm just waiting on hearing Aaron say, here, a cross, here's a crossbow, shoot it at me. Yeah, that, I, I actually really hope we get something like that. Just maybe not like a real big crossbow and maybe just shoot her foot or something. I don't know. Happy Fanda says, I hate scorpions, therefore I am the crazy vizier. Oh, uh, man. Lynette says, okay, I finally found it. Favorite line, 8.80. Silly cousins, helping people he never needed a reason. It was just fun. Uh, Thetacron agrees with Lynette, saying that was that one was really nice. Yeah. All these quotes have been fantastic. Uh, this, this was a good question, Mr. Europe. Thank you for uh, give, uh, putting it in. All right, let's go to another question. Um, I think we'll do this one. Here it is in chat. What is your favorite arc slash storyline of the volume? And then what is your least favorite or most disliked arc slash storyline of the volume? We kind of went over this a little bit at the very start. But um, I'll 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 start us off by going through my favorites, and I can't really say there was one overarching favorite since there were so many good ones. But I think one of my favorites was definitely the Village of the Dead raid. Just seeing that all come together and seeing um, a high level necromancer in play, and seeing you know just high level. Uh, combat in general was very very cool it it was it really it was just great i i don't know what else to say but ah man i can't even pick another favorite i think overall like just over the entire volume perandria was my favorite one i i'll just say favorite because i i loved all of them but terandria i loved seeing uh, more in depth, and I really love seeing Rabbit Eater getting to be Rabbit Eater, basically, in Terandria, and seeing all those knights, and seeing uh, ever, and seeing like, Alien, Alien Domus and all that. It just it was great. The the Immortals and everything, and um, Dioname, Dioname. I don't know. Not many people like Dioname very much, but I greatly enjoyed Dioname. But those are my favorites. Um, oh yeah, and the Liscor War arc was great too. It it showed something different that we haven't really seen much of. So I really like the experimental flavor of it, basically. Anyways, least favorite. Um, it's hard to say what my least favorite is because I I really did enjoy almost all of the arcs. So I'm I'm trying to think of an arc that I didn't enjoy too much. 
and maybe hmm maybe the Teslia stuff maybe just the like beginning of the Teslia stuff I, I definitely really enjoyed the latter half of the a Teslia chapters but I think the beginning of it wasn't as great for me but I still really enjoyed it all so it, it just may be like as a it's still it's still great I just liked it less than other stuff but Let's go move on from my opinions to what everyone else is saying. Ilias says Pisces had the best arc. The latter half of the Liscor Hectful arc was top tier, but all of Pisces' arc for the whole volume was excellent. Wistrom, uh, this is struck through, but said Wistrom probably the worst. Uh, changed my mind. Worst was actually Luan slash Freilings. Man, Lynette is just not having a good day today with all these people hating on Frailings. But I, I definitely agree. Pisces had a great arc, and it was one of the darkest arcs we've seen in a long time. So I, it was a great one, though. I really enjoyed it. I will disagree heavily on the Wistrom and the Frailings. I love the Wistrom stuff, and I love the Frailings. So I'm going to disagree with you there. but. Lynette says, Nears, full stop, both liked and disliked because we go through so much and get highs and lows and hilarity and despair. Nears was top notch, top notch. And we finally got to see what Signum is after so long. It only took 2.5 million words. Who would have known? Um, Happy Panda says, Kiss and Ver of Chandrar and Rabbit Eater at the. This is what they said at the Cron Muffler Pass. I know that's not what it actually is, but I can't remember off the top of my head what that pass is really called. But thank you for your funny name for the pass. But yeah, uh, both of those were excellent too. Linu says, oh, you, Linu, you wanted to talk? Go ahead. Yes, I want to talk. I'm talkative today. So uh, first one, would be just El Grand Magus, uh, El Davin dumping on uh, Immortals and Ael Damus because he basically went like, I came here to drink coke and slap some immortal asses and I'm out, I'm out of coke. He showed them that, oh, oh we are so immortals. We run, uh, we run this country. We are unbeatable we can do everything no one can win against us and there comes archmage of memory and wipes the floor with them every time they fight it was basically so so great for me because everyone knows that i have those uh murderous intentions of mine and i love just seeing stuff like uh, killing people by tens of thousands in story so when he he came there with fire with meteors with all that magical weaponry he used against them it was just like <clears throat> in my heart i love this and second one was another one like this which was a tight um arc of both Siege of Rain and uh, Wistram when they tried to free Ameris. I love it for so many reasons. First off, because mages got stopped. For second reason, because mages got crushed. For third reason, because uh, Snake got uh, burned by uh, that acid, by Quaras. That was really, really, really poggy when uh, she was like, Oh, I'm Archmage. You can't do this. And Quaras went like, Oh, who says? And just she literally killed her with her own weapon. That was so great. I love it so much. And Gazi going full ape shit on those people with her sword, killing or rather trying to kill them with all that blood blood buff. And also a siege of rain with all those people dying in there. And that sword, who, who which was supposed to be so OP. And those people who were uh, suiciding and bombing, uh, bombing uh, all those soldiers of Naravia Fallen. I actually did spoke with Pirate before that came out uh, that I offer different perspective because I said that I'm waiting for uh, some children's suicide bomber. We didn't get that, but we at least get suicide bombers. So with that, I was happy. 
And least inst interesting for me was Odessia arc. Nothing really was happening in there for me that I really liked because I don't like really diplomacy and such stuff like kind of boring compared to uh, Archmages get getting dissolved by acid. All right, well, thank you for that, Linu. Um, we won't go go into your bloodthirstiness, but thank you for your answers. Um, I think we have the most bloodthirsty reader in here right now, in Lino. Um, let's go on to the next responses. Yakovic says, Favorite is the Liskor War with the Crusader Ants. I'm a sucker for military stories. The worst to me was Terandri as a whole, but specifically the last part. Don't care much for the Immortals. Got some lip whiplash from reading from reading both arcs consecutively. Uh, I man, the Liskor arc. It, it was such a it was such a you know kind of different take than what we've seen. At, anywhere else in the story we haven't really seen an in-depth look into military stories in twi yet until that point in time and so seeing that and you know i i have to agree with you it was definitely nailed in a great way the the way that it was told and how you know we kind of saw the despair and the hopelessness that you would expect from a military story was really done very well and um crusader 51 sacrifice was very impactful i felt too it was just it was a great a great little arc that i wasn't expecting it to be as great as it was because like it, it was kind of pushed back for a long time because no one really cared too much and it didn't get too much too many votes for it on side story polls but when it came around it was it was a good one it it really it really was done well. You know, Terandru was one of my favorites, so I won't I won't get into how wrong you are about Terandru being bad. I can't believe you can't don't care about the mortals. So cool. Except Fithia. Fithia is not cool at all. Okay, let's go into the next response. Yash says favorite was Yelrone. I feel like I made are you really happy and in some way might have been influenced by him? Least liked Manus in the Hectful War? Oh, oh, really disliked War and Rhyme. It was tough to read so much about Nawal. What's wrong with Nawal? Nawal is great. And the Astral also says favorite was Relk. Yeah, I'm surprised we haven't seen more people say their favorite arc was, was Relk because... Relk was very popular in the polls earlier on in the volume. And his his chapters were really well received I, I, at the time. So I'm surprised we haven't seen more people say Relk was their favorite. But let's go on to the next one. Demi says, not on topic, but I hope Eldovin doesn't become an antagonist because because it would be amazing to see Eldovin and Terry Arc banter. Like them arguing who is the better one i i think it's kind of a foregone conclusion at this point that eldovin is going to become a primary antagonist but we might still see them banter anyways uh ren x face says i also wasn't the biggest fan of a Tesla, mostly because of lionette and sire it just made me feel a bit icky and this is coming from someone who isn't a fan of lionette x pawn well I mean, nothing real actually happened between them, but I get where the ickiness comes in because she basically was trying to make something happen just to get what she wants. So yeah, I, I understand it's pretty icky, but at least it didn't happen. Demi says, Fave is the raid on the village of the dead. Least fave is how Maviola became Bellevere's daughter. Alias says, Relk had very good chapters, but it was a long time ago and been overshadowed, I feel like. Relk was also the definition of a side story that didn't really lead into later things. That's my view on why we didn't hear more people say Relk was the best arc. Yeah, you're you're definitely right that Relk overall 
like in this whole entire volume, Relk's storyline was one of the few that didn't connect back into the overarching story very much. You know, he was kind of sidelined and just to come back later on. Um, but yeah, he, he was definitely a side story rather than a main storyline. Uh, Yakovic said, I didn't say Relk was the best arc because I thought Relk was from the last volume. Too many things happened in this one volume. Yeah, you, <laughs> I, I keep saying it, but it's a 2.5 million volume, or 2.5 million word volume. It's it's a gigantic volume. You, A lot of people kind of forget what exactly happened at the very beginning of this volume. Like I've seen people saying like, uh, the horns, the village of the dead raid was volume seven. It's like, no, that's volume eight. That happened in volume eight, people. That was at the very beginning of volume eight, basically. And we've gotten just so many chat or so many plot lines moving forward, so many plot lines coming together. It it's been a lot. Anyways, Stendercron says, incredibly lame answer, but I just like the Deadland bits. Aaron disrespecting every badass in line of sight was fun, and I like it especially at the realizing that there's a contrast between her and Ryoka doing everything possible to play the game of Immortals. And yeah, uh, the Deadlands, I I definitely enjoyed the Deadlands, don't get me wrong. I just feel like there could have been more of it at the end of the day, but because it was really fun. It was really fun to hear about all those uh uh, all those old legends and how Aaron interacted with them. But if there was more of it, it would basically just be Aaron, another Aaron volume. So you kind of can't have too much of it, but at the same time, you want more of it. Ugh. Hard to do. Alias says, It was like we caught up with well Relk just so we would know where he was and so we wouldn't be left behind, but virtually everyone had their story dovetailed back into one of the main arcs and Relk was just doing his thing. Well, yeah, true, but he did. He is back in Liskor with Aaron at the end of the day. So, you know, his his journey definitely changed him in many ways too. So, we'll get back into how he interacts with Aaron differently. I'm sure in Volume Nine, we're all looking forward to that. I'm sure. Yes, is Relk felt like the TWI of old times, a bit of nostalgia. Also, Selmy, we had that sassy boy all the way to the last chapter. Happy Panda says, I don't like Selmy, too much of a naive idealist for me. And yeah, he's he's very young, so I, I, you kind of expect that from young revolutionaries, I would say. They're all a bit naive in how they want things done, so I... I understand why you don't like him too much, but I think he was done as a character very well and how he's kind of that naive person. Except he has a ton of power because, you know, he leveled a lot because of his uh, his adversity. So maybe he can make that naivety and make everything how he wants it to in the future because of that power. All right. I think we'll move on to the last question since we're getting a bit over an hour now. And I don't want this to drag on too long since I'm not the one who edits this. Uh, and I don't want it to be too difficult to edit. So let's move on to this last question. Um, what do you all hope to see more of? And volume nine compared to volume eight. I know this is not really a retrospective question, but you know, I just think we should talk about what you guys hope to see of in volume nine now that we've all talked about volume eight. Um what I hope to see of and what I'm sure a lot of you are going to be saying is more Aaron and more slice of life focused. So I definitely felt Aaron's absence in volume eight and 
although I loved Volume 8 a lot, it just... Aaron is the main character to me. Like, there's no one else that really replaces her and how much I enjoy reading about her journey. So definitely getting more Aaron in Volume 9 is going to be fantastic. Uh, and Slice of Life, like, we definitely had Slice of Life in Volume 8. I, uh, I, I definitely don't want people to think I don't realize that, but it's like I, I see a lot of people who also don't think we had Slice of Light in Volume 8, but we did. We had it in many chapters, but it just wasn't center stage, and we were moving the plot forward so quickly. So I definitely feel like we should get back a little bit more Slice of Life, maybe just Slice of Life smaller chapters that the plot moves a little bit, but not too much. You know, that kind of deal. It it was something that we missed for a lot of Volume 8 those smaller slice of life chapters maybe we had a couple maybe like the pets of inworld that kind of chapter but let's move on to what everyone else is saying Besker says slice of life let's go and they use the best new mercia emote ever the let's go emote everyone should use it mr europe says aaron Lynette says crossbows. Okay, Lynette, we all know you're mad about the frailing, frailings getting uh, disbarged, but come on, no crossbows. Crossbows are evil. Uh, Nyrell says, Aaron, Linu, did you want to speak or? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So I want to. To, what I want to see in Volume 9 more is uh, Laken, because I feel like his role was kind of neglected in Volume 8, given his relationship with Tamarov, and that he's supposed to be like his mortal agent. So the, that's the first one, for sure. Second one is Eldavin, given that we know that he's still alive. I want to see how his uh, future will look like. If he is going to still fa uh, still fight against immortals in Terandia, or he is going to go back to Wistram or some somewhere, and a uh, third one is that I want to see more of, uh, of course, Rihir and Sylvania, because as we all know, a volume without Sylvania can be a good volume. That's all. I'm not surprised you want to see more Sylvania, but I am kind of surprised that you want to see more Lakin. Uh, I. I definitely agree, though. Like, the reason he wasn't able to be in Volume 8 very much is because of Tamaroth. And now that Tamaroth is being tugged away into the void for who knows how long, we're definitely going to see a Lakin, a, a Lakin standard arc in Volume 9. And it'll be, it'll be good from, you know, basically a whole volume off. And he didn't get much love in Volume 7 either. So, I think volume six was basically the last time we had a very Lakin centered arc. You know, he did show up in um in the very end of volume seven, but even then he wasn't really center stage. He was kind of just a host. And so seeing more Lakin, I, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And seeing we might even get him connected to the end finally. Cause they did it at one point with the Man of Stone on the Solstice, though. Who knows if that can be re replicated, but maybe we'll get Pebble Snatch back in the end at some point in Volume 9. Thetacron says, who's Aaron? She's just some... Oh, I can't even use this joke anymore. She's no longer a popsicle. She's just some innkeeper, okay? We all know... We don't care about her too much. Ilya says, Aaron... Brack says, Brack leaves an emote that just says, Aaron apologizes. Thank you, Brack. I don't know how to interpret this into words. Alias also says, Slice of Life. Yash says, Gods. Really? You want more gods in Volume 9? Huh. Kind of surprised on that. Uh, Yakovic says, More goblins and antiniums. Yes, both. Both of those. 
Nyril says, Aaron is a character of some season ago. Uh, I would like to see the boss in the dungeon below list score. We still don't know what's in there. I think, you know, this is just my crack theory, but I, I feel like that dungeon is going to be one of the ones pointed to by the gnomes. So we'll get it into, get more into it as the volumes progress. Happy Panda says, Aaron taking magic seriously, finally. Yeah, that would be really cool to see. You know, she has all this witch brew stuff now, so getting into a wondrous fair cooking would be really cool, too. Uh, Lynette responds to that comment by saying, she always took it seriously. In my opinion, she just couldn't cast anything till now. That'll be fun. Mr. Europe says, on a more serious note, I want to get back to a more local focus with global side side plots rather than several equally important plots going all over the world. I liked it in volume eight, but want to go home. And you're absolutely right. I think we will definitely see a more centralized plot rather than the decentralized plot we got in um, volume eight, because we have somewhere that... uh, we haven't been in a long time and we can, you know, focus more on just one or two locations rather than the entire world. Alias says volume eight may have had like 30% slice of life to 70% plot. In my opinion, I think normal volumes more like 50, 50 or 60, 40. Yash says gods, the sleeping demigod, goblins, golems, golems. Grave songs, my four G's. What are golems? Are like golems as in it's spelled as in the golem from um, Lord of the Rings. But do you mean golems as in um, what's her name? I'm blanking on her name. Cognita. Golems as in Cognita? Anyways. Thetacron says, I want to see some pettiness or Rabbit trying to punch Tyrion, Aaron pissing off Mags so long as she d- isn't shooting herself in the foot. Man is getting the middle finger from Liskor, Lakin getting, getting trolled, even though the poor guy just got freed of his slave contract, or everyone trying to punch Tyrion. <laughs> I, think I, I think I get a general sense that you don't like Tyrion very much. Um... But yeah, just smaller plots is are definitely something I'm looking forward to. Since we we've, we've got the grand plots going in the background now, we've got it all, you know, out in front from volume eight, and so now we can kind of cool off a little bit and see back into the small plots again. Elias gave the true best demo in chat, which is Mercia Double Pog. It has a great one, but I. I I'm someone who's flavor of the month oriented. I like all the new emotes. Uh, Yash says that's cursed. Yash, you're wrong. Happy Panda. I'm going to read this anyways. Only because Gazi Ah is gone. Gazi Ah was a terrible emote. How dare you say you like that emote? Um, Mob Tech says Pebble Snash and Griffin Hunt scenes would be nice. They really would be. I, I could get behind some Pebble Snatch again. Uh, um, I know everyone, like a lot of people, are like really mad that Pebble Snatch won her or her poll back in Volume Seven because it could have been something like um, what was it, Flora and Rahir. So a lot of people are mad that Pebble Snatch won and said, but hey, that Pebble Snatch chapter was good. I liked it. It was fun. Alias doesn't know what Gazi Ah is, thank God, because otherwise I'm sure bad things would happen if they knew. Linu says, would you be happy if we saw more backstory of Island Breaker or the Curse of Elves or maybe the Traitor of Tarangia? Um, uh, that kind of backstory is like ancient, ancient history at this point. So... It, eh, I, I would like it, but at the same time, I don't think it should be a priority. 
Demi says, Aaron reaching level 50 and consolidating her warrior, singer, innkeeper, and witch class somehow. I Getting to level 50, it's going to be a huge milestone. And I don't... Uh, just like getting a consolidated class name too. Like, I don't know if it'll live up to the hype that I have it in my mind if we get a class and I don't know about it or I don't know if, how I'll feel about it. And it's just, it'll be fun though. Ren says, I do wonder if Aaron will end up with a larger mana pool as a result of everything that's happened and her witchiness. I, she kind of has to, you know? Like, I'm, I'm sure witch... Witches are definitely spellcasters. Like they, they, they definitely cast spells as well as do all their witchiness. So I think she has to like kind of grow her mana pool a bit. Ilias says it's been said somewhere that it grows as she levels. In response to the Ren's comment, Demi says, "When well, isn't it said the body also grows firmer? Firmer? I'm not sure what you mean by firmer there." And they also say, I think by Geneva and the Selfids. Uh, are you, I, I'm not sure what you mean by firmer, but if you want to explain further, go ahead. Alias says, Pebble Snatch is cute. Flora would have been better, to be honest. Okay, uh, that's just a wrong opinion. We all have a few wrong opinions, but it's okay. I'll, I'll move past it. Linu says, you did realize all those were diff names for Sylvania. No, I didn't. I forgot those were her nicknames. Thank you. I don't want to learn anything about Sylvania ever. No Sylvania in the story. Okay, Linu, no more Sylvania. How about that? Huh? 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 Okay. Alias says, brought it back, but just for me, gave it a better name, though. I... Oh, for Gazia. Oh, God. It's back. It's back. Yash says, personally, I want to know more about how the world became flat, broken off the sphere. Maybe we'll find out more in the clues the gnomes left. I don't think the world is actually flat. Like, I think we've learned that it is a sphere, just that the giant cut in the middle of it makes everyone assume it's flat because it kind of... uh that giant hole, you know, kind of makes you assume it's flat when there's an end of the world. Uh, uh, Demi says it's a response to the previous comment and they meant stronger rather than firmer. But yeah, I get, okay, that makes more sense to me. Uh, Thetacron says Nanette being the first child taken into the end to not be uh, abandoned by Ryoka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Poor Ryoka. Linu says, you motherfucker, uh, am angry at you now, pouts. The Linu loves Sylvania, for anyone who doesn't know, and wants Sylvania to be the primary character of The Wandering End. And if you want to if you want to uh, send them reactions on how you feel about that particular stance, go ahead and ping them. Tell them how you feel about Sylvania, how she makes you feel, anything like that. Um, Naya Rell says, I want to see Rags finally becoming a queen or at least a lady slash lord. And yeah. The two major storylines, so we haven't gotten basically any, up, well, not any, we've gotten very few updates on in the past two volumes are Lakin and Rags. I, I loved Rags back in volume five, volume six, and earlier. So, oh, well, actually, not even volume six, because she wasn't really in there either. So volume five and earlier, I just absolutely loved Rags. So getting a more centralized, or centered uh, Rags arc in Volume Nine will be fantastic, and just her being back in the end after so long is going to be fantastic. But, um, Yash says the return of Greydath, more Goblin lore. Lynette says Island of the Gobbos. Yes, give us goblins, give us tons and tons of goblins. Who cares about all the people who hate goblins? 
We love them, okay? It needs to happen. We need goblins galore. Linu says, you like Rags because of her story. I like her story because tens of thousands of people die. We're not the same. <laughs> okay, Linu. Okay. You are too bloodthirsty for your own good. Uh, Onion Little says, I want to see the horns taking a quest and all of them hitting level 40. Oh, yeah. We didn't even... No one mentioned quests at all in what they were hoping to see in Volume 9. And... I I kind of blanked on that myself, but getting into quests and just seeing how quests are going to be handed out, how they're going to affect the story, it's going to be amazing to see. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Thetacron says, Goblin home linked to Goblin lands via the inn. Lakin blinks and suddenly senses giant crossbows on the walls. Poor Lakin. Can't get a break. Onion Little says, also quests in general. Yes, yeah. Quests are going to be fun. Um, Yakovic says, the book is the longest story ever, and we just recently got quests. Prologue is over. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into main story now. You know, just another 50 million words until we get to the ending. Bregor, I think I, I'm saying, I hope I'm saying your name right. Bregor says, a dwarf home. Yeah, we had, we've heard a lot about Dwarf Home. I'm not even going to bother trying to say Dwarf Home's actual name because I'll butcher it. But we've heard a lot about that place over over the story, and yet we've not even gotten a sneak preview into it. So it would be fun to get a, a detailed look into Dwarf Home at some point. Happy Panda says, just wait till someone gets a legendary quest of fetching a bread from the neighborhood bakery. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that will ever happen, Happy Panda. I am not sure. Uh, Linu says, I just want to point out, for all those people that just hear and don't see, that I was stupid <laughs> enough to ping myself instead of Wiggles. All right, Linu. It's okay. You're okay. Think that... Oh, Yash says, we saw XD. XD. All right. I think that will be it, though, for this discussion. So I'm going to end the recording here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. 